Welcome everyone to this is our second lecture of the semester. I start by thanking our sponsors uh, that include the, include the College of Arts and Sciences. We have a new sponsor that we're really happy to have, and that's Bartlett Tree Experts and also the Rhode Island chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. I want to thank Emma Winkler, Zach Driver, Katie Megan, and others. I, I think Kelvin. But if I leave you out, it's no slight intended. Who else? Kelvin. Kelvin. Uh, thank you very much for the reception that they put together for this evening. Uh, the lecture series is usually or is found online on a number of sites, but, but if anyone would like to get a, an email that just lists the series, you can contact me. Just let me know. Just come up and I'll write your email and get that on the list. Our next speaker in the series is Kim Matthews, Principal of Matthews Nielsen from New York City. and. I think that we'll continue to bring some very interesting speakers here this semester. Tonight, we're pleased to have Elizabeth Kennedy, a registered landscape architect and founder and principal of EKLA PLLC, a firm of her name, and that she founded in 1994. Elizabeth received a BS in Design and Environmental Analysis from Cornell University, and studied landscape architecture in the master's program as well. Her specialties are green infrastructure, landscape restoration, designs for resilience, and she's a recognized authority on the interpretation, development, and preservation of historic heritage sites. She's a HUD, uh, HUD, HUD graduate fellow and a design trust for public space research fellow. Her firm's work has received commendations for excellence from the Public Design Commission, the New York Landscape uh, Landmarks Conservancy, the Preservation League of New York, the U.S. EPA, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, the New York and Long Island chapters of the American Institute of Architects. Um, she's also received commendations from the National Organization of Minority Architects. Recent awards have included, uh, have included the Brooklyn Navy Yard Building 3 Rooftop Farm, which is a one-acre green roof project. The Marcus Garvey Houses Community Center Playground in Brooklyn, and the African Burial Ground National Monument in Manhattan. Her work has also received a Built by Women Award for Landscape with the Brooklyn Navy Yard Roof Farm, Green Roof Farm, and also for the Weeks, Weeksville Heritage Center. Both of these were received in 2014. She has spent considerable time assisting nonprofit organizations and government agencies plan, construct, and manage properties um, that plan, construct, and sorry, ma sustainably maintain cultural landscapes. And she's been recognized by the city of New York for her many efforts. Elizabeth has served as a juror for the Van Allen Institute's Design Ideas for New York's Other River competition. I'm, I'm wondering, is that the East River? East River. Ah. <clears throat> it's a competition. She's been a panelist at Harvard's GSD. She has spoken at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, Sustainable Brooklyn, and the Pratt Center for Community Development. She's a member of the ASLA and many a list of many organizations. We're really happy to have her here. Uh, Angelo and I both went to Cornell when Elizabeth was there, and I think this is, I think it's been 30 years since Angelo has seen her. 
So we felt we had to bring someone here who he hasn't seen in 30 years. So would you welcome Elizabeth Kennedy? Thank you. Can you all hear me? Can the, can the recording hear me? OK, that's great. I'm going to ask you all to come closer. I don't bite. And I'm going to ask you to come closer in part because this is a really, um, hopefully, an intimate, frank, uh, down-to-earth discussion about careers, about choices, about the options that I hope you have in front of you as you go through your academic work here and you find jobs in the larger world. It's a cautionary tale. All of that and more. So I'm, I'm glad Will said that uh, he, Angelo, and I go back a long time. I've seen Will like in the, in the course of the past five years, but I have not seen Angelo since he left school. But I remember that he drove a, a Fiat Spider. So, <laughs> right. So here, some of you may know that Dr. Seuss wrote a book called Oh, the Places You'll Go. And when Will invited me to uh, speak to you as a group, um, he wanted to know about my practice. And I'll give you a very brief summary. Uh, the practice did start in 1994. It started on December 30th, 1994. Uh, the description that I sent Will said that I started the business when I was collecting unemployment. I've been laid off from a job. Prior to starting the firm, with not an idea in my head as to how this would work, I was working in, in the development and construction of affordable housing. I'd done that for two years, and the company went under. And when it reorganized, they didn't have a place for me. So. Um, I'd taken a course in entrepreneurship. I was licensed. I was full of ideas. I didn't have a penny saved. I didn't have any clients. I didn't have a portfolio to speak of, but I started a business. I don't advise it, <laughs> OK? Uh, let me see. Aha, the evolution of a small practice and the path of sorts for the future. I'm going to talk today, I'm going to use three projects that uh, uh, have sort of defined my practice over 20 years. And with that, uh, explain what we did technically, what we did philosophically, and to show how those projects were springboards to other, other work. Uh, you'll find that, uh, you know, you can pull the curtain back and behind it stands literally the Wizard of Oz. Um, I don't want to say that anybody can do what we do, but anybody can do what we do, okay? I had the business for about three years, and I was doing uh, a fair amount of high-end residential work that was referred to me from other landscape architects who felt that the projects were too small for them. So you know that they were very small projects with very low fees. And um, I was living off of credit cards and pretending to have an office and doing all these other things. And I had gone to a trade fair with a model that I'd built of an urban design project that I'd pitched. And somebody said, oh, give me a card, which I had run off on a copier machine. And they said, um, we'll find something for you. And my first job in public work was what we ended up calling the mile-long fence. It was a 14-foot high security fence for a forensic facility. Does anybody know what a forensic facility is? A forensic facility is a psychiatric facility for people who have committed offenses. So it is part of the criminal justice system. It is part of a prison system. So this was a 14-foot high prison fence that had to be community friendly because the facility itself was in a residential neighborhood. And that project was my launch into public work. The firm now does 99.99999% of its work in the public sector. And that includes our work with nonprofits who get 
public funding. About three years into the firm, I got a call uh, to, to be part of a project team that was proposing to restore the Hunterfly Road houses at Weeksville, which are listed on the National Register of Historic Places and are New York landmarks, and also work on the Interpretive Center. This was in 1997. Keep that date in mind. So the reasons why I was called were not because I'd done historic work and not because um, anybody knew my portfolio because, as, as I told you, I was building it, but for the obvious reasons. I, am, I own a business as a minority woman. So this was a project, in a, this was a project of an African-American history in an African-American neighborhood, and they needed to throw African-Americans at the client. I will be that blunt. And I was asked to be exclusive, to participate exclusively with one team, and I agreed. And after the project was awarded, on the basis of the African-Americans that they threw at the client, they no longer had anything else for us to do. So I went to the meetings anyway, and I voiced opinions anyway. And I sat there, and even though somebody said to me, you don't have a track record in working in historic structures, I figured, all right, what could be involved? And I learned the methodology of the National Park Service and the, and the Department of Interiors for Historic Structures. And I sat there and gave opinions about the programming and the approach so that when that architect was hired, the client asked to retain me. So the first lesson I would say is, don't worry about it. Just you know, make sure that you show up for the meetings. Weeksville. <laughs> is in Kings County, which, is, which we know today as Brooklyn. And as you can see, part of what we had to do was to arrive at the story as to why these four structures remain part of Brooklyn, because they're one of the only historic structures, historic houses in the city of New York, in the five boroughs, that remain in situ. In other words, they are in their original location. And what we had to do was do an extensive background research. We had to redo the research that the other consultants had done. And we saw that looking at historic maps that you could see the topography of the old mapping of Brooklyn with the, with the Moranic Ridge. And this water body that shows up even in historic maps as the Fresh Creek. This is very significant because as you can see with the Fresh Creek, this drainage pattern began to extend all the way across Kings County in a way that led it to a community within this area named Weeksville. And it was named for James Weeks, a former slave who had come from Virginia and had settled in Kings County. At the end of slavery in New York State in 1827, New York was a slave state, the Dutch found that they could not maintain their properties. And so they began to sell off the lots. And there was a town building boom within Kings County, within Queens County, as a result of all this land becoming available. And within this area here was Weeksville. Brooklyn was much like this in this, I'm sorry, the famous painting. And in fact, the area of Weeksville was very much like this image. In fact, some of the maps show that the Vanderveer farm abutted the Weeksville site. You can see it here. And this road was called the Hunterfly Road. And the Hunterfly Road was a famous road known for houses of ill repute. It cuts across the site. And what was interesting in our research is that you can see these lines are the farm grid, the historic grid of the original properties in Brooklyn. And this was the urban plat grid that was extended after 1835. Here you begin to see the Hunterfly Road and how it was eventually changed by Brooklyn's urbanization. Again, that's our project site there. You can see this within the entire context of Ward 24. 
And what you had left at the turn of the century were these four structures and their fence lines, which happened to follow the Hunterfly Road. However, if we go back one slide, you can see that they were already off the grid. They were already interior to the block. This was the baseline for the first level of restoration of the houses. There was the decision to actually restore the fence lines as they're seen in this photograph. Not actually at what people thought they should be, but as they show up historically in any form of documentation. So part of the, part of the restoration strategy was to put, in, put back in place the level of decrepitude that was on the site. At the time we started on the project, all of the historic fabric was missing. But over time and working with the photographs and developing scaled elements, we were able to establish the historic fence line for the houses as part of the restoration. There's some other domestic elements that we also identified from photographs and put in place. Now this little, these two little fences are important because if you remember, the historic Hunterfly Road angled across the site. But when Brooklyn was urbanized, we then had an orthogonal grid. And this was the later fence line. And part of the storytelling on the site was to, was to restore the two fence lines to show the two timelines of history on the site. The second phase of the project with the second architects that who were asked to retain us were to restore the houses. Now the houses were occupied as late as, as in 1968 in this condition. You see the passage of the Hunterfly Road houses. The houses had already been restored. First plan, the, the building massing of the new interpretive center established certain spaces immediately outside as part of the program. And there was this remnant, what we felt was the farm grid. And what we did essentially was build the diagram. We created program area around adjacent architectural spaces in the interpretive precinct. We created a view shed towards the, hunt, towards the historic houses from the street. We created, and then we used stormwater management and created wetlands to separate the various program elements, very simply. We tested our ideas using a SketchUp model. So what it would look like with vegetation. And we exported the contouring from the SketchUp model back into AutoCAD. This allowed us to make sure that we had exactly the topography that we wanted to get. It made a huge difference. And this was done during the construction phase because the initial pass of grading, the contractors didn't get it right. You can see the site under construction. Again, under construction the first winter. The Corten steel walls, what I didn't say was that we maintained the alignment across the site of the Hunterfly Road, and we created two pinch points that would define it just by creating low berms separated by Corten steel walls under construction, the wetlands under construction, some problems in the construction there, me arguing with the architect, <laughs> the architect looking disgusted, right? The wetland being constructed, the model view. and the first year. Now, Weeksville <laughs> is what we call in the office our beauty queen. It has required a lot of our attention. It is still not complete. The contractor did not comply with the specifications almost at any turn. We are still trying to get him to correct the work. And what is, how old is this project? Can anybody tell me? Anybody paying attention? 18 years old. 18 years, right? It's a long time to earn a fee, right? 
The project, however, and, and, and to a large extent because of the landscape, even though it's, it's incomplete, has attracted a lot of positive attention. Weeksville is used as one of the literary examples of black history in New York City. It was written up in Newsweek recently. Uh, the site, the, the architectural aspect of, of the awards, it's won 11 awards to date. And we still haven't gotten to the landscape section yet. Because we started on Weeksville, and because we began to build up a reputation for understanding um, historical programming, we were then asked to work on Harlem Stage in New York City. Now, this is the, one th the West 135th Street Gatehouse, str um, Gatehouse, which was part of the Old, Cro old Croton Aqueduct water, um, <coughs> water distribution system in New York. And this was the largest of all of the pumping stations along the aqueduct system in the city. This building was decommissioned in the 80s because um, within the precinct of the, um, of, the, of the station, they had a massive water main break. And so what they did was they took it offline and they sold it to uh, City University for $1. It was converted into performing arts space. And as you can see, the site is extraordinarily steep. In fact, the photographs don't, don't actually convey how steep it is. What we then looked to do was to look very classically at the elements uh, of the structure and see how they could be juxtaposed with new elements. And what we did, we were responsible for the entry, the ramp that surrounds the tower, the corner treatment, obviously the paving surrounding and the larger plaza. So this was before it was restored, and this is it after. The other project that grew out of the Weeksville project for us was the African Burial Ground National Monument. Now, um, does anybody know about the history of the African Burial Ground? No? OK. Um, like I said, New York was a slave state. and one of the conditions of slavery was that the British um, prevented the burial within the confines of New York at that time of any Negroes. They had their own burial ground in a place called the, uh, on the shores of what was called the Collect Pond. Uh, this burial ground was eventually lost to history and then rediscovered when the federal government uh, was building the Ted Weiss building. And in the course of the excavation, they uncovered remains. This put a stop to the project. What then happened was, was archaeology was done. The remains of 400 individuals were, were recovered from the, from the courthouse site. And they were reinterred in a very small, a 60 by 90 foot area at the corner of Duane and Elk Street. This was the competition entry that won. We worked with the competition architect, again, on the basis of, of, of being able to say we had started on Weeksville. We, we were the landscape consultant, very limited scope. However, we worked with them on the orientation of the building, the interpretive mounds, and the planting. Again, working with a very simple element, SketchUp. That project uh, was open to the public in 2007. The third project that came out of Weeksville is more recent. It's a very slow going process. And yes, that's a goat. <laughs> We're working with Hebrew Free Burial Association on the restoration of Silver Lake Cemetery in Staten Island. Uh, part of the restoration work is, um, is getting the project listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its significance to social culture. Uh, this was a Jewish potter's field for um, Eastern European Jewish immigrants at the turn of the 20th century who lacked association um, with fraternal organizations that ordinarily would handle religious burial. This organization took them on instead and had a five-acre parcel in Staten Island that obviously you can see over time, volunteer vegetation, a lot of loss of headstones. And they're, they're slowly doing restoration work. And as you can imagine, clearing and grubbing a five-acre site 
by hand is a very time consuming and expensive undertaking. And we recommended to the client that they use goats to do a first pass through to clear vegetation. And it, it, they, within two weeks, the goats cleared the site. <laughs> two weeks. So we have other clients now, like Weeksville, who are interested in using goats once a year to also clear the site. While we were working on Weeksville, we, we were called in to uh, consult on uh, providing a green roof over burden for the United States Postal Service Morgan Processing and Delivery Center. This is a two acre roof. Prior to doing any, any, prior to this, we were doing little postage stamp size green roofs. But they said, can you do a green roof? And we said, why not? Sure. So if you can imagine two acres, 11 feet, 11 stories above the street in, in, in Manhattan, this is the project that we had. For us, it was very near the high line, which you can see in that light green banding there, satellite vision. We had to do this very economically. There was, a, there was almost no money. So the ideas of doing extensive and intensive roofs, we had to be very strategic about that. We did a, a design that ordinarily we wouldn't do, but we tried to eliminate all of the construction costs. So there was no cutting. There was, there, uh, we worked with the modularity of the pavers. We, we tried to minimize the areas that, that would have intensive planting. And the job was, the job was started and completed within nine months. So what we did was we were out there in November, just before Thanksgiving, and trust me, it was freezing, planting. And this was the first season. This is actually in spring. All of the sedum went to yellow. This is the context of the job. The Empire State Building is just to the north. And this was it in its first season. But again, we didn't have a portfolio doing green roofs. We didn't have a lot of experience, and we certainly didn't have experience in doing large-scale structure. But we did have an understanding of how the systems and the components came together. So as professionals, we were able to say, no problem. The, Mor the Morgan green roof led to the Brooklyn Navy Yard green roof. Now, the Brooklyn Navy Yard Green Roof was really interesting in that it wasn't funded. Do, do, do any of you know about the roof farm in the Brooklyn Navy Yard? No. Okay, that's good, too. Um, any of you know about CSOs? No. Okay. One of the issues that New York City Department of Environmental Protection is trying to address at this time uh, are ways of mitigating the impacts of sustained rainfall in the city. Because when you have these storm events, which as we know are becoming more frequent, one of the things that happens in New York is that the surge of runoff overwhelms the combined sewage system. That's, let's say, 90% of the city. And so the strategy that the DEP has is if they can retain somehow the first inch of stormwater runoff, they can prevent the overwhelming of the, the water treatment system and the discharge of raw sewage into New York's waterways. So they're, they're, they are funding across the board a lot of grant, they're, they're funding a lot of projects, private owners, to do any sort of water retention project and they are interested in particular in innovative projects because, of course, this allows them to repeat the model as of more interest to other people. So the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which happens to be my landlord, called and said, we're interested in figuring out how to put a green roof, a roof farm. We have a tenant who's interested in, in putting a farm on one of our building roofs, and it has to be able to meet the DEP's requirements. Now, that's very simple. 
100% of the first inch of storm water. So what we show here in this diagram is 100% of the water falling on the entire roof. Right? And where it's concentrated. But what we have is a situation where we had to come up with a way of picking up the water that fell on the white areas. Because we knew that we could retain anything that would fell on the roof farm overburden. But it was the white areas that were of concern because we had to meet the 100% threshold. This means that in contrast to typical green roof design, where you do want the water that falls on the quote unquote white roof to flow towards the drains, we needed to figure out how to impede that flow without exceeding the capacity of the roof to carry the entire overburden. So in, in comparison to a typical green roof where you have this drainage layer, what we did instead was we came up a way, with a way of having water that fell on the white roof infiltrate and be stored below the planting medium in an aggregate layer. So we created a sponge layer below the, below the farm layer. And this detail continued all the way across the, the roof to a point where we get to the drain. And if you know anything about green roofs in general, you know that the planting medium used is very poor in nutrients. The, the nutrient profile is, is, is really sort of thin. So you can imagine in a farming operation, they're just loading this with fertilizers. So this roof farm had the same problems that an ordinary roof farm would have, or an ordinary farm would have, which is, which is pollution, you know, um, excess nutrient pollution runoff. So what we did, which was the innovation here, was that we designed a sump system to collect the excess fertilizer before it decanted into the drain beyond that first inch. And this is the innovation that became the standard for all DEP funded roof farms in the city. We'd never done one before, but we set the standard. So this is the roof, this is the overburden, and we're farming. At the opposite end of the scale, the Navy Yard comes to me and they said, listen, we need to show that we can put a bioswale somewhere in, the, in our industrial complex. And, and they found a location and we designed a small bioswale for them. This then led to our being asked to be involved on a project where we would supervise the reconstruction of, of five badly eroded areas within a watershed to create public space. This was entirely on a, a <coughs> construction management project for us, something that, that was also new that we had to a, a, adapt to and we geared up for. What I'm trying to say in all of this is not that we're great, because we are, but, <laughs> and, and, but that none of this was planned when I started my career, that's for sure. And none of this was planned when I started the firm, that's for sure. But we, we have been able to adapt to numerous types of new challenges and innovative projects that have come our way that have also served us very well because as Will said, you know, we've gotten a certain amount of recognition for the work, but more importantly, we've serviced our clients a certain way. And we were able to do that because even though we, we have certain disadvantages in experience, definitely funding, we've made sure that we've concentrated on the basics to make sure that the practice was very firmly rooted in design principles, technology. And what I mean by technology is not computer technology, but construction technology. If you work for me, you really have to know how to build because that allows you to interpolate and extrapolate from those basics the next level of work that, that we've been able to build on. 
future directions and services, what you'll see here is a bottle tree. And I am ending this part of the presentation with this because, again, this is weeks, Phil. And a lot of times we found that when we did cultural projects, we hand over this great landscape to the client. And in this case, we still haven't handed it over, but we, we plan to hand over this great <laughs> landscape to the clients. And they don't know what to do next. They don't know how to actually implement <coughs> the ideas and the programs that they raised during the planning, planning phase of the job. And so one of the services that we are branching into as a business is actually working with clients on post-construction programming. How do you actually sustainably use the sites that you've, you've put forward and developed? And we had an intern this summer who worked with Weeksville under my supervision. And he worked, he used the community design model to help these young people in the community explore their history through that model and through examples at Weeksville. They culminated with the construction of a bottle tree, which you may know is an important um, landscape artifact and ornament in, African, in, in Southern African and traditional African American communities as a spiritual, as a, as, a, as a receptacle of spirit. So they did oral histories, they did community history, they looked at all thi these things through participatory design as part of the internship program and they captured it all in a bottle tree towards the end. So if I had to s summarize this at all, I would say in, in, in each instance of these projects, we had a game-changing contract that involved on-the-project training. So at no point could we kind of sit back and, and use our inexperience as an excuse for not moving forward on the job. And what it, what it gave us the advantage of leading to experimentation because we kind of didn't know what we were doing. Um, we are a very diverse firm. Uh, not everybody until recently wanted to come out to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to work with me. And so who you got were people who definitely needed jobs. But out of this sort of semi-ragtag group became a very diverse group of committed designers who bring an outsider's perspective to clients' needs. It shapes our perspective and approach, and it's turned to be our competitive advantage. We're very small, and we're very flexible. So when clients come to us with small, innovative projects, it's very easy for us to do this type of work, whereas it's more difficult for large firms to do this work. Over time, we've been able to evolve and clarify what it is that we feel that we, we serve as a niche. So in that sense, the the nature of the work and the ability to adapt and be able to, to move without a specific plan and for that matter a specific market has allowed us to actually clarify where we are now. And we do have business goals that are based on this journey. So I would say for you, if I could be a mentor for two seconds, in the course of your time here, you have to become prepared to face and take advantage of rapid changes in an industry driven by factors outside of this industry. Landscape architecture is changing very rapidly. For instance, there are advances in civil engineering that are Im impacting what we do. And you'll see that most in responses to climate change. I know that your, your program has focused a lot on that issue. This is going to be a huge area, but wherever the, wherever the practice goes, you have to understand that forces outside of landscape architecture are impacting it even more rapidly than before. You have to understand materials and methods of con construction in principle. You don't have to know everything, but you have to understand how things work. It's very important. Um, you got to accept that you know, what you're, even this, this particular discussion, uh, what you're learning in academic settings doesn't have any context until, until you put it into practice. So seek opportunities, no matter how mundane they seem, to get practical experience. My recommendation, if you guys have a chance to work in construction, in a nursery, 
that should be the first internships you actually target, not necessarily working in an office. And you accept that you will interpret your education for the rest of your life. This is only giving you the foundation and that you're just going to build on this as you go forward, wherever it is that you do go forward, because trust me, even somebody like me who didn't have a plan, it's worked out pretty well. Thank you. Now, I know you're just bursting with questions. Any questions? Uh, so you talked about a lot, of, a lot about these projects, uh, giving you other projects. Did you actively advertise or look for clients during this time, or was it just clients that you were recommending you for other projects or asking you to come back to consult on other things? Um, we, <laughs> we have terrible business practices. <laughs> terrible business practices. It's one, of, it's one of the Achilles heels of the firm. We do not properly advertise. We do not properly market. Um, there are other issues that I won't necessarily go into in this, in, in this forum, but there's a, there's a strategy that you have, to have to, you have to capture lightning in a bottle repeatedly. So when you get these chances, you have to, you have to make sure that people know that you can do this work. How you do it depends on a lot of different things. Uh, you give lectures at, at universities, right? <laughs> but you, you, the people that we do business with, and I should, I should have explained this mo in more detail. New York is a market where there aren't a lot of landscape architectural projects, or the, or the landscape architecture is not the driver of the project. It is part of the project. And so the, the, con the, pers uh, the entity that usually gets the contract is an architect or an engineer. And it depends on the sensitivity of the architect or the engineer to what it is that you're putting in front of them at any point in time. And as you know, um, your attention span is, is far more fractured, that there's more information to process at any point in time. So you have to be very strategic about how you build this work. We happen to have been on teams and people liked what we did and they asked us. So we got, we got repeat business. But that, ri that, that ripple effect wasn't as broad as it could have been. So we didn't leverage as much as we could have. There was another question? So you start on projects that you don't have experience on, but you have the right attitude. Um, who are the consultants who give you the technical expertise that allow you to make the right choices? I would... <laughs> we, have, we make sure that one of the skills that we have is good research skills. So we are able to very quickly examine areas where we don't have expertise on multiple levels. We, d we have, um, we sort of take the, what is it, what is it called, the, the dummy's guide to whatever it is, right? We, we start with like a dummy's guide. The first thing we do, if we have to start in a new area of practice, we'll do, we'll do a literature search and it won't, it won't be an advanced technical literature, literature search. It'll be a popular literature search. And when we start to do that, that, that so, so that we can build up a fam familiarity and technical, uh, and familiarity with the issues. Out of that, we can quickly identify what the technical issues are. And then we keep going until we max out what our expertise should be. So we have to know what not to take on. There's certain, there's certain things that we should not do because we can't expose, we can't afford the exposure and the liability. At that point, we'll be working with the architect or the civil engineer. Those tend to be the two consultants we, we work with the most, sometimes it's structural. But we familiarize ourselves very quickly with the issues on a number of different levels. That's part, that's built into the process of doing the work. So the, the two-acre or one-acre green roof would have either a structural engineer 
for a civil, someone who's looking at the structure, or is it the architect, who's determining what the load bearing capacity is and how that going okay. to be. This, this is another thing that I didn't explain. Every single one of our projects is multidisciplinary. There isn't one, even where we use the goats. We actually took the lead in that project, and we, we managed the archaeologists, the civil engineers. Um, there's a structural engineer involved because we're rebuilding structures, right? And then there's going to be a co conservator for the headstones. So we, we, we have to understand the scope of what they do and, how th and, and the phasing and the appropriateness of their role at what time. So you have to be able to build an overview of the project. But um, in all instances, we work as part of a project team. Oh, he first. Okay, <laughs> you first and then you second. Okay. Okay. Um, so we're, Will and I are teaching a course together, and it's an interdisciplinary course. And we spend a lot of time um, kind of thinking and noticing what the challenges are of interdisciplinary work in terms of different work ethics and work cultures and expectations and, and that sort of thing. And we've been saying to the students a lot, this is an example, you know, this is practice for what happens when you go out and you work on interdisciplinary teams. And so I was curious if you would be willing to share some of your challenges in working with that multidisciplinary team, um, maybe things that it, one it, might not expect. Um, Some of the challenges, quite frankly, are the way that the prime consultant has envisioned your role. So, for instance, New York, a lot of, many New York architects, because of the, the built environment culture in, in New York, are not experienced with dealing with landscape architects. And the first, the first giveaway is that they talk about landscaping, right? The, the, the landscaping. And they, and when they ask you for a proposal, and you say, could you clarify my scope of work? They can't do it because they don't know what it is that you do. So if you look at the project and look at the way the, the client, the end user, has defined it, a lot of times you'll end up writing a scope of work that overlaps severely with the civil engineer. And unless you can get their attention to tease this out and say, what is it that you want us to handle? What is it that you want them to handle? That can be very frustrating. Because among other things, you'll, you'll find that you might have priced yourself out of participation because they're not, an, they're not anticipating the scope of what you do. They're also sometimes not interested in the scope of what you do. Um, a lot of times when we work, we, you have to, it's like the relationships that you have professionally are like dating. You have to be really selective. It does not make any sense to work with consultants who don't, fellow consultants who don't appreciate what you do. Because you spend a lot of time trying to explain to them what you can do. Anybody seen that new GE ad where the young guy is talking about he's going to work for GE and the friends are like, what are you going to be doing, driving trains? And they, they take the cake away. A lot of times you can have that kind of conversation. Quite frankly, they're a lot of times, consultants are not expecting a black female to be an expert at the table. So that takes work and a lot of patience and sometimes a lot of gin, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, so part of your role as a firm principal is cultivating relationships that are going to work for you on a lot of levels. There's communication across the board and building trust. Now. You may have guessed, or may, uh, maybe I didn't convey it, but I tend to convince people very, very early in the relationship that I know what I'm talking about. So there is an immediate level of trust, and I, and I know how to assert myself by degrees because I'm used to listening to clients. So if this is where you're coming from, I'll, I'll point out the consequences of that decision making and build from there until we've created a climate for our, our, our ideas that is palatable. It's a large part of the work. Um, engineers pay better because their fees tend to be bigger, but they don't always know what you, what you do, and they're not always experimental. So you have to be very careful 
who it is you want to do business with. And that comes over time. I don't know if I've answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, would you say that your new uh, innovative system of filtrating stormwater on roofs is turning more people on to green roofs and having them? You mean for rooftop agriculture? Yeah, and just, just green roofs in general. Well, green roofs in New York are very popular right now, the idea of it. And then there's, there are tax incentives and credits that you get if you build a green roof of a certain type. The other part of this is that you have, you have a funding agency, which is the DEP. And I should explain that the Department of Environmental Protection did a cost-benefit analysis. And they, they said, we can either do tons and tons and tons and tons, and billions and billions and billions and billions of stormwater detention or we can pay people to put a green roof on, on, their, on their property. And it turned out that that turns out to be more cost effective in conjunction with street side bioswales and some other in, in interventions. The roof farm creates a lot of excitement. It's a, it's a sexy project. People like the idea of growing vegetables on a roof. The roof farm costs a million dollars to build. How many acres of arable land can you buy for a million dollars? <laughs> Far more than that one acre, okay? So the question is, because people ask me, you know, Elizabeth, is, do you think that this is a promised land? And I said, I'm very skeptical. Unless your cost-benefit analysis is going to make this work for you. Tomatoes grown on a roof in, in roof light taste terrible. But... Tomatoes grown for seed in roof light, who cares? So if you were to say, okay, we're going to delegate certain purposes for rooftop agriculture, that to me makes perfect sense. Biomedical, seed production, a couple of other sort of high rent things, that makes sense to me. Food on the table, there's only so much broccoli anybody's willing to eat. So this, this ties into, I'm glad you asked about the roof farm, because it ties into really understanding the fundamentals of soils. Way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and Will, Angelo, and I were in school, did we ever do a soils course? You might have. I know I didn't. P, you know, pH, da, 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 and you write specifications and there's this broad range and you hope everything will come in. We no longer strip arable land for topsoil to put in projects. Manufactured topsoil is not the be-all and end-all solution. It, it, it fails. So they have not resolved this replacement issue yet. So you have situations where you call for natural topsoil from, de from development sites. The contractor circumvents this. He brings a product that doesn't have the pH, it doesn't have the tilth, it doesn't have the soil structure, it doesn't have the nutrient profile, and he puts it there and he walks away. And you have a construction manager who says, it's, it's dirt, what's the big deal? But then you have plant material that will not establish itself and thrive. And guess who they're calling at 2 o'clock in the morning when the plants are not established and thrive? and thrive, right? Okay. So you have to be on top of this in a way that definitely was not in place in the industry 15 years ago. So this goes back to high school chemistry for me. And it doesn't have to be more complicated than that on a decision-making basis. Now to go to Will's point, I know who to call about soils. And I had no problems making dumb, asking dumb questions until I built up the vocabulary where they became smart questions. But when I need to do about soils, there are two or three people I call. Sounds like some economics comes into it. Too. Always, always, because you want to have a project that's sustainable. And, and sustainable doesn't only mean that the plants recover at the end of a drought, <laughs> right? It means that the client can can operationally maintain 
this installation that you put forward. Native landscaping is very, 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 very expensive to get established. It's a dirty secret. Is there a compost you can add to the wet soil? Compost raises the pH of soil. You're better off adding compost tea, which does not raise the, the pH of soil. Things that are native to the, the East Coast and the Northeast in particular tend to prefer acid-loving soils. So if you're going to use native plants and then you have, you have alkali soils, you have a mismatch and the inability of the plant to you know, draw nutrients. So you have, you have to figure out a way of doing this. There was another question. Yes? Mm -hmm. You know, Queen Elizabeth, she waves like this. The, there's a thing called the royal we, and sometimes we is one person, and sometimes we, we has been 14 people at one time. Uh, like most business, most, most firms in this industry, you ramp up and you ramp down, you, you do these things. So right now, when I started, it was me. This question came up earlier at dinner in a studio apartment. Uh, got a couple of projects, couldn't see the bed, had to go out and find cheap space, and that's how I ended up in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, where I've been for 20 years. Uh, right now we have, I lost count, it should be about five or six people. Um, when my mother died, it was me and a laptop computer going back and forth to England. You do what you have to do. Why, did, why didn't I make my commute much easier? Um, when, when you, you have to have a formula for keeping your overhead as low as possible. And there have been certain trade-offs because somebody had said to me very early that Elizabeth, you will not get talent to go to the Navy Yard. And it's true, if people, people wanted to, you know, well, Brooklyn, Brooklyn 20 years ago is not Brooklyn today. I can get people to come to the Navy Yard. That there is, you know, they show up now, whereas before that was not the case. But at the time when I needed to, to find help, you could not find the caliber of help that might have helped you, help you springboard your business because everybody wanted to be in Manhattan. But I couldn't, even though I lived in Manhattan, and I live in Manhattan, I couldn't afford Manhattan. So I had the opportunity to get space for $4 a square foot as opposed to $20 a square foot. $4 a square foot allowed me more breathing room, allowed me to make mistakes, allowed me to recover from mistakes that I made. And I made tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of mistakes, right? But when you, have, when you have this sort of breathing room in that your, your, your rent is not that expensive and, and you know, um, certain other things are, n are not as expensive as other things, then, then, then you, know, you can recover if you've, if you've erred in judgment. You know, we had a situation very recently, I've staffed up, where we're on teams and we work for the architect, and the architect works for the client. That's the, even though the architect has said, we need you to have a landscape architect, I don't have a relationship with the client. I have a relationship with the architect. And the client was unhappy with the architect and withheld payment from the architect. So there's an African proverb, when elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers, right? We couldn't get paid. And that's when you start looking around and you think, we need to sell that, we need to lay off this person, peanut butter and jelly for, for six months. Because in your, professional, in your professional practice class, if, you ever, if they ever talk to you about multipliers, 
multi multiplier is the rate at which you you multiply somebody's direct effort on a job in order to cover overhead and profit and that person's salary. In the industry, it's about 2.5. So if you come and work for somebody and, and you're making 50000 a year, which translates to $25 an hour, 25 hours times 2.5 is 62.50 an hour. That's what you're billing the client. If you start to lose money, you're losing money at 62.50 an hour. So you don't start to just lose money, you start to hemorrhage money. Okay? So these things that you have to keep in balance, and yes, there was a question about the economics. All of these things come together in this mix, this fruitcake that's called practice. So it's technical expertise and it's, it's, it's aesthetic sensibility and it's client relations and it's a relationship with the bank and it's engineers who love you and it's architects who hate you and, you know, parents who are patient. <laughs> All of that. Has it been fulfilling? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it tough? Yes. Is it rock and science? No. Any other questions? Uh, I would like to thank you very much for a, a, com a comprehensive uh, talk about small practice. Uh, it's, it was really, I have many quotes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not rocket science, is the important uh, one. <laughs> if, anyone, if any of you would like to talk about fruitcakes, uh, afterwards, um, please come up and say hi to Elizabeth. Otherwise, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>